Greetings and salutations to all you folks out there. We're back with another 4 versus 4 on the map Corona. This one's going to be a little bit different today, but before we jump into that, just got a couple of quick little announcements to make. There will be no uh, Thursday live stream or any videos on uh, Thursday and Friday. I'm going to pre-record one Supreme Commander cast to come out on Thursday on Thanksgiving Day to give you all something to watch, but I'm going to be taking a little bit of a holiday for myself. The live, the live stream will be up as normal Saturday, 6 p.m. Eastern United States time, which I believe is GMT minus 5, um, but there is not going to be a whole lot of content uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, because that is holiday time. I'm going to be spending a little time with my family. All right, to jump straight into this, this is a little bit different because... This is going to be a 300, actually zero rank to 700 game. Now, I'm going to pre uh, preface this with the statement that I will make a lot of snide remarks in this cast, and I mean no personal offense to anybody in here, because people have ripped on me for that. Like, don't you realize that this is just American sarcasm coming out, and I'm going to make a bunch of snarky statements. So hopefully the guys in this game will watch this, will have a good laugh, and will learn something from it, because we're going to see a lot of weird things, basically. Uh, this is the rank range where some people know more tricks than others, some know some good builds, some know some good unit abilities and how to take advantage of those, and others are just completely clueless. So we're gonna see this huge variety of things. For instance, the perfect symmetrical, the perfectly symmetrical OCD build. That is one option that you have. Then you have the adjacent to Hydro and actually probably watched a build order tutorial or something like that. So there's a good start for you right there. And then we've got get out of the way of your mass extractors and not necessarily a terrible build, but probably going to mass stall. And then a double adjacency for the land factory with actually a solid build going on there. So a wide variety of things. Let's go ahead and introduce the players as these guys are rolling out their initial units and then we'll jump straight into the action. On the north side, we have Noise. He is taking UEF. And then in the gray color here, we've got Muy Bonito. He is taking Cybran. On the plateau up here, we have Fat Larry. He is also Cybran. And then Everywhere, 116. He is the 700 highest rated player on this team. Actually, no, there's two 700s. My bad. And uh, he is going Aeon. I do like the Fat Larry name. On the south side, we have Legend of the Stars. That is a presumptuous name. He is taking Cybern as he very well should. Sonny Quackbar taking UEF. <laughs> I'm sorry. The Silly Lamp is taking Aeon. And then we've got Healy246 uh, or Hele. I'm not sure which one it is. He is taking Cybern. So there are the players. There's the starting positions. And we're going to go ahead and see where these guys are headed. Obviously, I'm going to buzz through a fair portion of this at advanced speeds so that we can get through this as quickly as we can and to kill any dead spots in the game. But I'm going to try to catch as much as I can. We got some uh, labs colliding here in the middle. We have a flare and a mech marine. The flare is going to take out the mech marine and survive with about half health. And then we've got another mech marine that's going to come up and kill it dead as a doornail, so to speak. Then we have a huge collection of hunters. One, two, three, four, five, six, and another grouping coming out in the back. So apparently Gray has decided to go with the speedy land build, and I do mean that quite literally. We are packing away jesters in the rear portion here. Legend of the Stars doubling down on his air build. He's got 230 power and is actually respectably balanced. Nicely done there. I was about to click on him and say, good lord, he's power stalling, but that was not the case. So we've got these six labs moving in. They are going to definitely score an engineer kill, deny a mass extractor, and probably pick up a second expansioneer moving along the plateau. The, the ACU is going to move forward, and honestly, it is incredibly difficult for labs to kill an ACU. They are one-shot kills, which means that in 20 seconds, your ACU will vet from 20 kills, one shot per second. That bumps up your health, bumps up your regen, and you can see how as that stacks, you're going to need a buttload of labs to even come close to endangering the ACU. The ACU is just going to calmly move up, claim a mass extractor, and then just stand in the way 
of any of those units moving anymore. We've got T1 bombers coming in to clean up the mess. Again, one shot kill on labs. Just going to try to clean up that mess a little bit there. And we've got some early tanks moving in from Noise. So these guys are definitely doing the early aggression thing. Not a whole lot of static play here. I could recommend maybe a little bit better unit choice. Tanks are going to be much more effective than the labs are. But you know what? The mentality is good. I'll give them credit for that. They are getting out there and doing something and not sitting in their bases and turtling up. The Bombers and Jesters continue to flow from the south side. Legend of the Stars and Heli, Heli, Hele, Heli, whatever it is. They're both getting a lot of T1 Bombers and a lot of Jesters. Well, more T1 Bombers for blue. But either way, they're all getting a lot of combat air units and yet more labs. And this is exactly what I was talking about. Pop, 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 pop. That is going to knock him up to 12 kills on the ACU, getting ready for a veterancy there. Jester's moving around the outside of the map. Those are probably going to move in on this expansion for purple. Maybe for purple himself. Here comes the air from blue. This is going to be an attempted ACU snipe. Now see, we already have some mobile anti-air in the area and we do have interceptors from the north side. There are zero, zero interceptors for the south team and Jester's are beefy units. They are going directly after the ACU after killing off some T1. That is going to buy the ACU a little bit of time to run back. Not many interceptors to be had. They're doing their absolute level best. 500 health. Good night. That was close. And the bomber crash impacting the ACU. A final unit coming in dropping below 200 health. So very, very close call for everywhere. Looks like we've got five more Jesters trying to reach that commander. 400, about to tip 500 health coming up. Nope, they're going to take a holiday and go after all those units. See, if there would have been just a few interceptors from the south side, that would have been an ACU kill or maybe one more Jester. That was so dang close. T1 anti-air going down. Couple more hits to the commander, dipping below 1,000 again, but I think he's going to be fine from here on out. More Jesters trailing in there, but now we do have interceptors from gray and then some from yellow as well. And this is actually a commendable reaction by the North team. They saw an air threat and literally the entire team started building interceptors. And that's something that you don't see in a lot of high rank team games. You're more likely to see, why the crap is my air player not building air? It's all his fault and now I'm dying. And these guys are, you know what? Someone almost died to air. Let's all build our own air. Why don't higher rank players do this? Here we have the revolutionary battle reenactment taking place. Lines of soldiers marching up to each other and then obliterating each other's faces at point blank ranges before moving the columns up once more. Everywhere coming out the clear winner on that one, but here comes some T1 bombers to try and do some damage. Unfortunately, flying directly over the T1 anti-air. Still gonna land a couple of solid hits there and those fragile Aeon units going up in smoke. T1 bombers are going to be a good throwaway item for quite some time to come, thanks to all of the Aeon T1 on the map. But yeah, it is highly unfortunate when you fly over a construct like this. We've got uh, many, many, two, four, six, seven anti-air emplacements on that Mesa, directly in line with all of the units on this side. So nicely done there. Not so much for uh, Hele marching right into that static defense. Not, uh, I, I can't really say too much because I have done that myself a time or two, but it's definitely something that you want to try to stay away from. So much reclaim on the map, holy cow. What are our reclaim numbers looking like? It doesn't look like anyone is reclaiming, which I guess should not be a huge surprise. Uh, yeah, lots of, uh, lots of wrecks laying around the map. Guys, queue up an engineer, put it on a patrol order. It will give you lots and lots of mass, and income is a good thing. We have Loyalist out for Moy Bonito. He is on 32 mass per tick income and keeping a nice little bit of power in the bank, and he's putting out a steady stream of Loyalists, so not too much going on wrong there. And holy cow, he went for the OCD base as well. Hold on, let's slow this down a little bit. Let's just admire these guys' bases and think about the mentalities. We have some clear-cut marching orders on this side. And we have perfect symmetry 
in this base. The only way it could have been better is if this factory was on this side, but he is actually filling in the gaps for the P-Gens with uh, flak emplacements. So yeah, perfect build right there. And then Gray has actually incorporated mass storage into his P-Gens for a double ring on the air factory. Maximum adjacency, please, and thank you. Coolio. On the north side, we've got a little bit more conventional. Excuse me. That is not indicative of what I think of this game. That is me getting about four hours of sleep last night and getting up for work early in the morning. Lots of energy storage going down, which I can't entirely get on board with, but he is building T1 engineers for the majority of his build power, which is typical of an air player. So yeah, kudos for that. And then we've got an upgrade going down on that ACU, lots of eclectic things kind of scattered about the map, and ooh, T2 gens going down, and a shield emplacement, nice. Very, very nice, always want to see those. On the south side, we have a fire base going up. Holy cow, what a base it is. We've got uh, four, five, six triads, and four T1 point defense, six T1 point defense, along with multiple flak and T1 anti-air. So he's pretty much got everything that you could possibly ask for in that game. Oh, Loyalist moving in. That was two, three, and four overcharges. Beautiful kills. Two doubles and two singles for that ACU to save himself from certain doom with the Loyalists on that side. Nicely done there. And uh, losing a large portion of the base to T1 spam from the north side, which is why he had to vacate the premises in the beginning. We've actually got an artillery drop on the south side. Another commendable activity. Everywhere is dropping in units to raid the outside edges of his opponent's base and that is exactly what you should be doing in just about every single situation. Again with the symmetry, we've got three shields, three P-Gens. Not sure why we need three T2 P-Gens when we're on 32 mass income, overflowing 2,000 power. Well, he definitely will not ever power stall, and he's definitely feeding the air players. I think the same kind of thing is going on with noise overflowing 1,800 power while still barely minus mass. Yeah, I think you've got a power overbuild problem there. That is a little bit beyond preventative maintenance, that is for sure. Already got three T3 mass extractors for Fat Larry. Fat Larry is apparently going to be the economic powerhouse this game. He has got a buttload of mass, and hopefully he can spend all of it. He does have a fair bit of build power, but he is rapidly ticking up. He needs, I think he accelerated his economy past his ability to spend it. That is going to be resource allocation dumped, and now we have nice power and mass numbers. If he had the T3 upgrade, he does. He could drop a monkey lord right now, no problem whatsoever, and probably steamroll his choice of players on the south side. Here we've got T2 static artillery. Legend of the Stars trying to clear that Mesa out, so actually that is not a bad investment. That is going to be able to kill pretty much everything over there, and now we have the units finally pinged on the south side. T2 tank moving that direction. Should be able to deal with it all, no problemo. This is worst case scenario for Aeon Firebase right here. We've got loads and loads of T2 and T1 units. That means that these point defense are going to have a hard time with their low rate of fire. This could raffle stomp that firebase right now if they just plow in full steam ahead. No worries about the things to come. Just get in there and get work done. Let's we'll say we're going to go for another aggressive T3 mass extractor upgrade. No overflow as of yet for Fat Larry, which is very nice to see. He's about to drop two T3 P gens as well and going for hives. So this is going to be his build power. I might have started it a little bit sooner, but I think he'll be okay. At least he is getting there at his own pace. Mobile missile launchers pounding away at that oblivion turret and the tanks moving up through. Gunships are gonna come in to harass, but there's plenty of flak in this grouping right here. Nice reaction once again to knowing that the other team has a decent amount of air. At least there is a massive tack launch the ASCU has spotted it though, and he is going to get the hell out of dodge. That was a dozen TAC missiles. 
not exactly the most secretive thing in the world. It is going to take out a P-Gen. That ACU is going to run for the hills. The fire base is no more, and now these units are going to be able to move in through the base. This is a bit of a problem, because we're 41% on a T3 factory upgrade. If these units just push directly in, they might actually be able to swarm the ACU, but you know what, now that I'm thinking about it, no, that's probably not the case, because he's throwing down point defense and a shield right at the gap. If I were him, I would be building T1, maybe a shield or two with the ACU, and have all my T2 engineers on that factory to get Harbingers up as quickly as possible, because Harbies are going to be the best way to deal with all of that. Jester's flying directly into opposing interceptors. Not exactly the brightest thing that I've seen today, but you know what? He probably had his reasons, so we're going to forgive him for it. Many, many flapjacks flowing across the map. Not a bad choice at all, because you're going to be able to reach out and touch any defensive emplacements that the opposing team is going to throw up. Looks like... T3 Air Factory is going to be the priority. Gunships moving in to attempt a kill on this, but there's the mobile flag. That, folks, is exactly why you build flak all day, air day, because it will absolutely demolish any gunships that dare to come near your units. More T2 point defense going down, quickly followed by some T1 in rapid succession. Those are going to be your damage dealers. And then once again, planting some overcharges with that ACU. Not a bad defense at all. That is going to work out very well for him. He's got a T3 engineer out here. He's now he's gonna to try to get a shield generator down. He's gotta be careful, because there are a lot of flapjacks over there. Looks like we're gonna get a couple of loyalists donated from the right-hand side. We've got a couple of flapjacks on this fire base, but again, that is a ferocious base without much to fear at this exact moment. Loyalists are going to be able to deflect missiles if they get under where the missiles are falling, but if they run directly into the line of fire, yep, one of them's gonna go down anyway. One of them is alive and another has joined him. They are going to trail up and kill off as many of those flapjacks as they can. Nicely done there. Mongeese moving forward. Looks like gunships are going to come to the rescue of the remaining units beat back those loyalists and I think that is going to bring us to somewhat of a stall. Uh, yellow's pushing a little bit. This is like on the north side we do have a, at least one T3 mass extractor down for gray. So Moy Benito jumping that 75 mass per tick mark. Looks like Healy is the lowest on the board at the moment with 21 mass per tick income and 1k power, mostly thanks to those two T2P gents. He is attempting to build a lot of Corsairs, but he definitely needs to tech up those mass extractors first in order to have the mass to actually do things. So many interceptors out for yellow. Uh, actually would present a challenge to green because there is only a single ASF online, and that is not exactly what you want to have happening versus that many interceptors. T3 artillery moving up just a little bit, fainting, moving back, moving up. Gonna have to unfold and lay down some fire on those T1 point defense. Holy smokes, that's a lot of firepower from those trebuchets. Once again, yellow venturing a little bit too close, provoking the anger of green, and now we do have harbingers to deal with. This is where it's gonna get a little bit sketchy because once you get this many harbingers in one spot, T1 and T2, yeah, not a chance. Harbinger's just going to walk all over it, no problem whatsoever. So I think this nice, tightly woven formation of units is about to lose a lot of brothers in arms. I, it intrigues me how much of this game is taking place with squad move orders or uh, the control group move orders. It, it is actually kind of fascinating. And it is an accurate comparison to the whole uh, regimental warfare of the Revolutionary War stage of history because, yeah, it's basically columns of units lining up. They have different colored shirts on so you know who's on whose side and then you just march together and fire on command. Apparently not a whole lot changes in the face of war. You got loyalists forming up to fight other loyalists, which is kind of hilarious in and of itself. And T2 gunships moving up to try to harass the outside edge of that. So far, not anything super terrible happening here. 
This is, this is the slaughter that I was predicting just a moment ago, but this is actually a bit of a problem. However, none of that mobile flak made it into this group, so these T2 gunships are going to be able to very easily deal with a low health unit such as a mongoose. There's the monkey lord! We now have our first T4 on the map, and Harbingers have finished doing their dirty deeds on that side, and those are, what, 8 kills, we've got 12 kills... 10, 9, yeah. All of those guys are vetted up quite heavily. I think that was a near 100 on that one. Let's watch this Monkey Lord for a minute. Anytime you get a monkey on the map, you can have a little bit of fun with it anyway. Let's actually track this son of a gun. There we go. Do a little cinematic shot here. Monkey Lord is going to move up through the T3. There's a bit of air harassment there, which can be a problem, but when you're vetting up off of all of these helpless T2 and T3 units, then health is not quite so much of a concern. The trebuchet fire, on the other hand, might be, because that's just going to be persistent damage over time that you can't really touch that much. 51,000 health. Unfortunately, fifth vet has been achieved, which means no more healing effects for that monkey lord so now he's actually got to think do i want to donate this mass to the other team or do i want to bring it back in and uh see what i can do on my side there goes a strap bomber purple has achieved t3 air in a big kind of way asf coming in to wipe that strap bomber from the earth but not before he drops twice 10,000 health an aggressive amount of regen but this is unfortunate. He is not kiting far enough away from these units. Normally you'd want to control KT2, but in this specific instance, it's not actually that big a deal because the Monkey Lord cannot vet anymore. So it's not going to be able to regain the health that it's losing from those units. OP Obsidians, wiping that Monkey Lord from the face of the earth. So sad that the hippie scum is dealing damage to the cybers. Harbinger's moving out to the north side. That could get very, very messy incredibly quickly. We do have a nuke going down and a T3 P gen. Let's see what we got here. Sunny is pulling 47 mass per tick, which is not going to get him a nuke anytime soon, although he is persistent. And if you don't have power to run a nuke, you need to build the P gen first. Because the P gen does not provide adjacency bonus to a strategic want a strategic nuke that has already started building. The power has to be there before the missile starts loading in the chamber, otherwise you don't get the adjacency bonus. So yeah, if you build the nuke and then build the P-Gen and you realize that you've basically not uh, built any of the nuke or you've only built like 1% of the nuke, then I would actually stop and restart the nuke in order to get that full adjacency and help with any power stalls that may or may not be happening. So the Harbingers are now wrecking this crap We've got all of our vetted Harbs up here. Ah, 15, 14. I love looking at these numbers because these are such beautiful things. 28. There's a highball. High roller. Well, Titans and T2 are no match for a squad of Harbingers, and that is quite problematic for Yellow at the moment. He had his T2 Air HQ out front. On the front lines, that means no more T2 gunships until he rebuilds back in the base. And he is going just about 100% Titans at the moment, which are not in any way going to compete with the Harbingers. Also, don't stream units. You want to clump them up in your base and hope that you can land a couple of good solid overcharges with your commander in order to assist all of those units. Pretty much the rest of the map has gone dead at this point. Purple is doing a little bit of movement, but there are harbingers in the way that will prevent any run-bys there. Looks like Gray is bringing a buttload of loyalists. Holy cow, that's a lot of them. That's impressive off of 75 Eco. He's been building those for a while. And he is going to bring them to the front in order to try and assist with those Harbingers. Harbingers are going to flood between the factories, killing off all of the build power, all of the hopes for Yellow's survival. Now they are going to go after the commander. Nope. Yup. There's the focus fire order. Dropping to 9,000 health. Harbingers do a disturbingly high amount of damage. 
but they're not going to make it through these loyalists because there's the stunning death weapon effect it's going to just encompass those harbingers no 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 the last two alive right before they get stunned deliver the final blow here comes strat bombers from the right that is going to take care of any harbingers that may be remaining but that is the end of that yellow is down green is now free to roam the map with his beautiful harbingers as he very well pleases well harbingers are going to encounter the op obsidians We've got two overpowered units in their respective categories. Which one will win? Well, I would say the one that has more mass invested in it, and I'm not really willing at this pers at this specific point in time to pull out my calculator and calculate the mass density of these armies. However, I will say the damage is more densely packed with the T3 and is probably going to win this regardless of what purple does. I do like the mobile shields in the group. Nice composition there on those unit clusters, but yeah, it's just not going to be a match for the huge swarm of harbingers that is right there. Strat bombers are gonna be a problem because when you're running in a clump, strat bombers do a lot of damage very, very quickly, especially cybern ones, which have the huge area of effect. I do appreciate the heavy harbinger build though. He should have some flak in there. Mobile flak is all you ever need. Not really necessary to build T3, although T3 uh, mobile missile launchers, or T3 mobile anti-air is debatably better at hitting strat bombers but flak hits just fine and most of the time does more damage uh realistically speaking so yeah just go ahead and build flak looks like four yes four harbingers going down in one past all those strats it's actually a bit of overkill two orders and a split attack move would have actually killed twice as many i think it would only take three strat bombers to deal the damage necessary to kill uh, the combined health and HP or the the shield and HP of those units They are gonna move up purple did have some t3 mobile anti-air in the area to try to deal a little bit more damage to these ASF ASF fleeing pretty much the whole way across the map being tailed and that is a good way to lose a lot of unnecessary uh, air units all right soul ripper is coming along very very slowly because Turquoise is assisting it. So, yeah, 47, uh, 47 mass per tick. Nothing going to the nuke at this point. He is strictly trying to get that Soul Ripper in the air just a little bit sooner. All right. Well, interesting game to say the least. We have mass extractors dying. What is hitting them? Is that the strap bombs from earlier? It almost looks like a TAC missile launcher, but it can't be. Up on the north side, we do have some bricks moving in now. I, I just completely missed that. Oh, T3 artillery. Yes, right there. Holy cow, I'm blind because I'm focusing on the left, the south side. Strap bombers moving in from, well, they're both purple. That's going to be everywhere adding his strap bombers to the mix green is just dominating the land game but he has got to got to move these asf in and take out the strap bombers if he can keep the strap bombers off of his units he would be able to take out pretty much the entirety of the map with all of the harbingers that he has built unfortunately it's just not working out that way which is highly highly unfortunate to restate a repetitive redundancy all right, Harvey's moving up. They are going to be stopped in their tracks by those bricks. And Loyalists hitting them as well from the south side. I think this is going to be a win for the north. That artillery is just going to be too damn strong to overcome for this side. They've already lost a significant portion of two bases. They're trying to build a monkey lord with basically nothing. Reclaim! Back to reclaim! There's enough mass lying around on this map that you should be able to build that Soul Ripper no problem. Just over here, let's uh, take a look. That is all the mass on the map. Look at that heat map. All of this, readily accessible by green. All I'd have to do is stick some engineers up in there and voila, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of mass that could be had. He's got freaking Harbingers. Put him on patrol. He can reclaim with the Harbingers. You can't ask for any better deal than that. 
Also, if you have artillery pounding away at your base, then you should definitely assist a T3 shield generator. Because if you assist the shield gen, is he actually fi Nope, there he is. He is firing at the shields. What is he trying to hit? The mass storage? Is that what he's focused on? I guess that uh, artillery is auto-aiming. Oh, there go all the harbingers. If you assist a T3 shield, you can regen a fairly significant portion of the HP between the bullets, as long as you have a lot of build power. If you have like a dozen or so fully upgraded hives, you can actually maintain a single shield versus an artillery or four or five Novaks. Um, not that difficult to do. You're going to see Novaks is a fair bit in this rank level of game. So yeah, just build some hives and build a big shield. Uh, Seraph MT3 or a fully upgraded Cybern T3 work really, really well. And then just assist the ever-living hell out of it. Here come the strap bombs. I don't think there's any way this ACU can dodge it. And there goes the... Oh, nope. 7,000 health. Here comes another pass. Can he kill all of them? That is the question. One hit. Two hit. Three hit. There goes the ACU. And Harbingers in the base on the south side. That is going to be GG for those folks. Silly Lamp taking it in stride. Nicely done, North Team. Basically eco-whoring the entire time. So, yeah. A little bit of aggressive play. A little bit of weird play. A little bit of air play. A little bit of everything. And that is a 0 to 700 ranked game. Alrighty guys, hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Sometimes it's interesting just to watch one of these games. I had that one sent in to me and it had a fair bit going on in it, so I wanted to cover it for you. Um, we will be probably returning to either Average Joe's or I have my eye on a one versus one between Mephi and Mad Mozart, which is kind of hilarious. So I think that's probably what I'm going to cast in advance for Thursday's game. As always, guys, thank you so much for watching. Appreciate all of you who send in replays, and please keep that up. Send me all the games that you possibly can, and I will see you in the next one.